Everyone's on the verge of a breakthrough today. In fact, you've already broke forth. God is going to break out in your life and do what you've never seen Him do before. Would you lift your voice one more time? Would you thank Him in advance? Thank Him with your dance. Thank Him with your praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo, somebody give Him a shout of praise. As you remain standing, my assignment today comes from the book of 2 Kings chapter 7. I'll begin reading at the first verse. And the word of the Lord declares, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, Shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, in the gate of Samaria? Then a lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, If the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Lord Jesus, I ask that your anointing would be upon these next few moments. May the words that I speak be life and light and direct the pathway of men and women to you, to your will, and to your word. May your blessing be upon this. The gift of prophecy, may it settle in this house and on my lips. And may our hearts be open, my heart included, be open to receive what thus saith the Lord. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. If you believe that there's something very special about this day and moment, that Jesus wants to do something great in your life, would you just respond however he would have you respond? <laughs> and with the Lord's help today, I feel that this message is more like a prophetic utterance. That's the word that I'm feeling today, that what I'm about to share with you may come out as a prophetic utterance to those that will receive it. And for those that receive it tomorrow about this time, yeah. something supernatural is going to happen in someone's life. And this is simply, I don't know who it is. I don't know where you're sitting. I don't even have to know. I just want to know, are there any believers in the house that say, I choose to believe the word of the Lord. And I'd like to entitle this, it's time to move forward. Tell that to somebody around you. It's time to move forward. God bless you and you may be seated in his presence. As our revival series this summer ends, the Lord gave a prophetic utterance to this congregation on a Wednesday night when the prophet stood here. If you were in the service, you know what I'm talking about. The Lord gave him a vision as the people stood at the altar and he said he saw a book and he saw, as it were, the page turning. It was the conclusion of his message and he came back to the pulpit and asked if he could say something. He said, I feel like not knowing the life of this church. He said, I feel like the page is turning tonight in this church, meaning that God is getting ready to write the remainder of the story. A new chapter is being birthed, that the old chapter concludes and a new chapter begins. And we receive it as the word of the Lord from a man of God. I've meditated on that and prepared 
to speak to you on this morning. And what I could not get out of my spirit is the fact that the past for someone here is what it is. But the grace and goodness of God, no matter what your past may be, the grace of goodness of God always leads men to repentance and always leads men to the cross and always leads men to the purpose that God has ordained for you. And so this morning as I stand here, I pray that that phrase will settle in your spirit. That each story may be different. Your story is not exactly like my story. God did not make us exactly alike. But each story is just a little different. And though your story is not my story, your story is so important to God that you, if you will just hear His voice and allow His words to influence your future, that there is no telling what God will do. For I say today, under the unction of the Holy Ghost, that someone here has been in a famine. You've been in a famine and your life is dry, your life is empty, and if God doesn't intervene, ultimately you will die. You will die spiritually before you ever die physically. But I stand in the gap today and I send out a certain call to tell you clearly that it is not the will of God for you to die. That you can die spiritually and go on living for years physically. But it is the will of God that you be alive to Christ. And when you submit to God's will, there's something that begins to explode in your spirit. It's God life, that Zoe life, that spiritual life that cannot be attained by anything else. You can't get it from good books. You can't get it from great friendships. You can't get it by living in a nice home or a great area. We live in an area that people spend a whole year working so they can vacation here for just a week. And they leave. And then I talk to people all over the country. Yeah, I've been to Clearwater. I, I've been to that Pinellas County. I love that area because their vision of this community is a place of rest and beauty. And it's a place of water and palm trees and sand. And while it is all of that, it is so much more than all of that. Because in this city, there is a growing, dynamic, incredible group of men and women. In fact, when you step in this congregation, you'll actually find people from every continent in the world. And it is simply because we just love the people of our community. We don't care if you're from South America, from Asia, from Africa, or if you came from the South or the North, or you're West Coast, East Coast. Or maybe you're one of the few that actually was born here and didn't move here. We don't really care where you come from, but we're connecting with people in this community who have a deep hunger and desire to know God and to know who He is and to know what He is doing in this city. As I flew in from North American Youth Congress, Yesterday, I texted my brother, Andy, who's here. He was working yesterday. He works in Tampa. And I asked, because I hadn't made proper arrangements for a pickup, didn't leave my car because I'm too cheap to spend all of the money there for parking. And I realized I need a ride home. And Andy was not able to give me a ride for prior commitments. I said, no problem, bro. I'll catch an Uber or a Lyft. When I got to the curb, I just summoned a lift through an app, and I met this really incredible man from Spain. His name is Joseph, and Joseph helped us with the luggage. I was a little nervous because I had five, including the baby. We had luggage, a lot of luggage, and a baby stroller, and I'm thinking, I'll go ahead and choose the lift for six, because I have five people, and then maybe the extra space 
And Joseph pulls up and gets out with a joyful attitude and helps us pack. And I think, I don't even know if that's a part of his, his job responsibility. As we drive, I find he's from Madrid, Spain. And he, uh, that connected with me because my grandfather's people are from Barcelona, Spain. A lot of people say, oh, you're Italian because you have the name Anthony. No, I must have got an, uh, an Anthony for a middle name and uh, really a Spanish last name and they nixed the X off so they could get more work in America at a time when it was much better to be of Italian birth than to be from Spain. And, and so that was generations ago. And while I'm talking to this man, we get to the house and I just felt prompted to give a business card. He didn't even really talk about church. And I said, I'm a pastor, I'd like to invite you to church. And, and I gave him the card and then he just opens up and begins to really like talk about God. And he said, I came from a very, uh, very traditional religion. And something really puzzled me because I prayed, we, we prayed to God, but we also prayed to all of these different people. And he said, I, it just bothered me. And he said, I would ask my mom, isn't there only one God? And mom said, that's right. He said, why do we pray to all of these people? Well, to make a long story short, in his search for God, he felt drawn to a church and, and there met his wife. And, and he's talking to me and I'm just standing there. And he keeps emphasizing, but there's only one God. And, and, and as he's talking, I began to talk and he said, and then I went to this Pentecostal church. Now this was a by chance app lift driver who I was very thankful for. And he said, and in the church, he said, it took me about two years to get used to the church because I don't know any of y'all ever been there. You don't have to get up and raise your hands. But he said, it took me about two years. He said, but while I was praying, he said, the pastor pushed through the crowd and he laid hands on me. And I began to speak in a language that I had never learned before. And, and he said he, he received the Holy Ghost. And I'm standing there looking at this gentleman. And, I, and then he said, I said, well, were you baptized? He said, oh, oh, yes. He said, they taught me that when you make a check out, you don't make a check out to a father or a son. Uh, but, but you make it out to, to, to Joseph. And, and whatever the name is. I said, you, you were baptized in the name of Jesus? And he, he said, oh, yes. I said, where? He said, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I said, Pastor Scott Sistrunk? He said, yes, and Nate Nix. I said, Nate Nix is my cousin. And stand up, Joseph. He's here today. Let me just tell you something. I felt the love of God when I was talking to this man. This man, man speaks different languages. But he has been filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in the name of Jesus. Can I tell you something? Some of you are so worried why things don't work out. While the bus, why the bus gets there late. Maybe the bus got there late because there was somebody you were supposed to meet in a gas station. You're so worried why the lift, why you got to get a lift driver. But you don't know that God is orchestrating relationships because he has an assignment for you. And so today I come by the power and authority of the name of Jesus to tell somebody God is working your situation out. And while you don't understand it all, while you may not have the load to carry like some have to carry, while you don't know relationships or situation, this one thing I do know that the steps of a good man, of a good woman, are ordered of the Lord, and he delights in his way. And today I say under the power and authority of the Holy Ghost that I'm speaking a prophetic word into this church to whosoever will grab it, believe it, and walk in it, that it is time for you to move forward. You cannot live your life by following and dwelling on the mistakes of your past. Sure, you failed. Maybe you may have felt that you even failed to such an extent that you just can't go on and do what you wanted to do. But I say the blood of Jesus is greater than your failure. 
that the love of God is greater than your sin, that the power of God can reach into every situation, every country, every car, every moment, and that the blood of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the name of Jesus is at work even now. He's at work here today, and God wants to do something incredible in your life. I want you to give somebody a high five and tell them it's time for you to move forward. God has not called you to go back. He has not called you to sit down. He has not called you to turn around and run away. In fact, he called you to this congregation for this moment and this time. You have been called for a purpose. And today my assignment is to release you into the purpose of God. In order to release you, I have to speak faith to you. I have to tell you that you can do it. That God is with you. And that what God has sent with you is greater than anything that is in front of you. There's no mountain too high. There's no army too big. There's no sea that's too deep. That God can't take you through it, bring you over it, or help you overcome it. That my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. How's he going to do it? By Christ Jesus, our Lord. This incredible story can be read really in two chapters. You can read about it in 2 Kings, the sixth chapter. If you began towards the middle of the verse, and you began reading in verse 18, actually began in verse 13, and you'll see an interesting story in which the king of Syria decides to attack the people of God. He decides to send his band of armies, roving enemies and adversaries of the people of God in to pick off, destroy, and besiege the people of God. But what was amazing that while the people of God were under attack, God sent a prophet, Elisha, and every time the enemy would try to position himself, the prophet Elisha had a word for the king. He said, don't go down that road. Don't go there because the enemy's waiting for you. This is in chapter 6. And so the king of Syria was very frustrated by the fact that he couldn't nab the king of Israel. He couldn't seem to find him. He asked his servants, he said, who among us has been talking to the Israelites, letting them know where we have set our ambushments? One of the servants spoke up and said, it is not any of us, but there is a man of God, and he is in Israel. He's a prophet, and he hears even what you say in your bedchambers. When you're talking and making plans in your private room, it's as though God, and he does, lifts what you say puts it in the ear of the prophet and the prophet warns those that are in authority so the people of God are directed can I say God still does that that God we believe in prophetic ministry that we believe that we need a word from God in fact a word from God will release you man I feel a prophetic utterance here today he'll release you into this next season and you don't want to go in this next season on your own words you don't want to go on your own power or might, but you want to be released according to the power and authority of the name of Jesus. And so while this man was frustrated, we find that in all of this, that this, this king could not secure the king of Israel, for God was with him. And then there comes a moment in verse 15 in which the Syri Syrian army surrounds by purpose the prophet Elisha and his servant. The servant wasn't in on everything God was telling the prophet except by connection to Elisha. And when he sees the army, the horses and the chariots, verse 15, he said, Alas, master, how shall we do? How are we going to get out of this? And I love what Elisha said. He said, fear not, for they that be with us, verse 16. Some of you need to underline this, highlight this, 
You need to say the God of Elisha and his servant is the God of my family and my situation. He said, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with him. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Because he saw, but he didn't really see. He saw in the physical, but did not have understanding or vision in the spiritual. And so he saw only with the limitations of his physical body. But when God opened his eyes, the Bible said that he saw and behold, the mountain was not just full of Syrians, but the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. And they came down, the enemy did. And when they came down, the same Elisha that prayed that the servant's eyes would be open to see what was happening in the spirit. Then prayed to his enemies and asked God to blind the eyes of his enemy. Now I've actually prayed this prayer in this city and said, Lord, would you, because I got a little ugly with it. I said, Lord, would you gouge out the eyes of the enemy in this city? Would you blind their vision? I don't need for them trying to interfere in any way with what God is doing. I don't want them to touch any one of God's little ones. And if the enemy has had an assignment on you today, I declare by the power and authority of the name of Jesus, you may feel like you've been whooped up on, but help is coming today. For I speak to the vision of your natural eyes to go all the way deep to the heart that is within you and that you will be enlightened by spiritual eyes to see more are with you than are against you. And if you knew what God was doing in your life, you would have no fear because though you may walk through the fire and though you may go through the storm, God has promised, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the earth. Can I go a little further? I got to jump over to the writing in the book of Romans chapter 8 to let you understand that when Paul was writing, he said this. Verse 31, he said, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Somebody needs to prophesy to their situation and say, I don't know what to say about everything that's happening. But I can only say that God is for me. And if God is for me, say that. I don't want to just slip by that. Say, God is for me. In fact, I want you to expand it because you're special and all, but you're a part of a special group of people who have been called out of darkness into this marvelous light. And the God that is for you is for you, 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 and me. And if God be for us, who can be against us? When you really realize the weaponry that God has, it almost causes you to feel sorry for your enemy because you realize that your enemy starts with a disadvantage. If you've read the end of the book, you'll know that he does not win. And the only way that you can lose the battle is if you give up and begin to believe the report of the one who starts with a lie. He is a lie, starts with a lie, and ends with a lie. But I just say the devil is a lie, and I'm not going to believe his report today. For everything that comes to my ear is not true. And every voice that rises against me will not prosper. I don't accept every prophecy that the enemy speaks against me. In fact, I reverse the curse and send the word back, and I just say that God is for me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Rather, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God. Who also maketh intercession for us. And here it is. Who? 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 Not just what. Who? 
When the what separates you, you need to find out who's the who behind the what. <laughs> Ask your neighbor, who's the who behind the what? Who? Because I hear this a lot. What shall separate us from the love of God? More like this. What shall separate us from the love of God? But I got to say that the word actually says, who shall separate us? I know it's not you, baby, because you ain't bad enough to stand against God. I know it's not me because I don't have the power to stand against God. And when you get to thinking that you're all that and a bag of chips, you'll find out that God really doesn't need you to succeed in his kingdom. We would love to have you be a part. But if God be for us, who can be against us? If God is on our side, for who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who's going to come in between us? Shall a tribulation? I don't think so. Shall distress? No. Persecution ain't going to do it. Famine? Uh, nakedness? Uh, pearl? Or the sword? It is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all of these things, that means every persecution you go through, every tribulation you face, every trial, every time you go without a little bit of food, you understand that even in my difficulty, I am more than a conqueror. I'm not just a warrior, but I'm a warrior of warriors. I'm a fighter of fighters. I'm a champion. I got a belt better than any belt on an MMM, MMA, or a boxing a championship. I've got the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who has robed me in righteousness and set his crown upon me. And when I get ready to fight, I don't fight in my own power, but I fight by the authority of the name of Jesus and the power of his word. And so we find that this chapter 6 really ends in verse 23 in a very interesting way that there's a verse that you have to catch. Because verse 23 said that after Elisha sent them, for God blinded them, he sent them into the city. And the king of Israel had them captive. And then God opened their eyes and they saw they were captive and the king of Israel asked the prophet, he said, should I kill him? He said, no, nah, don't kill him. He fed them. He humiliated them, demoralized them, and sent them away. Commentators say that between verse 23 and 24, perhaps years happen. You can't just read the Bible. You've got to read the Bible. Because verse 24 just says, and it came to pass after this. We don't know how long after this. But it came to pass that Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all of his host because the devil is a glutton for punishment. He got whipped so many times, but he's going to make one last stand to see if he can come in and besiege the people of God. And the Bible said that when he besieged the city, he surrounded it. And what that means is he cut off the supply routes that brought food reinforcements and support that the people of God were then in the city walls and they were surrounded they ate up everything in the city you know what it's like when the hurricane comes and you're not one of the ones that made it out of the city you're in the house and you ate up all the chips you drank all the water you're getting parched now you're eating bread and well we better dig in the vegetables now because we don't have much left but you eat up all your supplies and then you don't have much left because the grocery store has been raided and you and, and your supplies run out. You can't wait for the electricity to come on because you know that the stores will be up and running again. But what if the enemy surrounded the city and when you got through with your food, then you had to just scrape and scrounge for whatever you would eat at some point anything you could eat. You would turn rocks over and eat slugs. You would eat bugs. I know y'all say you don't, but you probably would if you go long enough. You would set pails out for rainwater. You would go out and fish. You would do whatever you could do to eat. The Bible said they got so hungry that, that they started selling a donkey's head for 80 shekels of silver. A donkey was an unclean animal. And the head wasn't really something that you would eat unless you're hungry. 
a fourth part of Doug's done for five shekels of silver. People were paying their money to just get something that they would not even normally eat because there was a famine and there was no more food coming. The king of Israel was disturbed and as he walked one night along the wall, there was a woman's voice that he heard. He said, King, would you help me? And as he responded to her, he heard her story. That when the woman yelled to him, he said, well, he said, you know what? If God can't help you, then I don't know what I can do to help you. And the woman said, well, I made a deal, an agreement with this lady. We were so hungry that we said, we'll, if you will eat, we'll eat your son today. And then we'll boil and eat my son tomorrow. And that's where they were at. Cannibalism. Do you know why all of this was happening? Because Israel chose to follow sin and God used their enemies to lead them back. Sometimes what you've gone through, as difficult as it is, actually help get you back on track again. But the good thing about God is he's not going to leave you there. That he still loves you, but he doesn't want you following the ways of your enemy. And here's what happened. The king went in sackcloth and ashes. He was grieved. The lady said, you know, we, we boiled and ate my son. But then on the morrow, she hid her son. And we couldn't find him. And the king was devastated that this had happened. So in all of this, the people of God were besieged. And I find that here, the people of God were at their last. They were paying money for stuff they wouldn't even normally eat. And chapter 7 opens and I got to bring this to a close. But I got enough stuff to just preach you all into the afternoon. But the, the, the prophet of God, the same prophet that warned the king, that spoke to the man whose eyes were not open enough to see the angels, that spoke to the armies of the enemy and blinded them. He showed up at the gates of the city and began to talk to the king and the man on whose hand the king leaned. He began to talk to them. And he said, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Tomorrow about this time. Whew, there's something that just leaps in my spirit when I read that. I know you've got the three-year plan and the five-year plan and the ten-year plan. Nothing wrong with the plan. But don't let your plan keep you from God's purpose. Don't let your plan keep you from a miracle. Because God may want to do more than your three-year plan. And he said something that they could not even see with the natural eye. He said, tomorrow about this time, you're not going to be buying donkey's heads and doves dung. He said, tomorrow about this time, that a measure of fine flour will be sold for just one shekel. And two measures of barley for a shekel. It's going to be in the gate of Samaria, the place that is besieged, the place that the enemy has under attack, that the enemy is trying to starve out and pick off. And the man on whom the king leaned, a royal officer of authority and power. You know what the man said? He said, he said, if the Lord would make windows in heaven. He's a little smart aleck. If, if he would do this, might this thing even be? I mean, what he was saying was even if heaven opened up, I don't think this is possible. And the prophet looked at him. Because there is one thing that God works on is the fact that he, when he speaks something to you, wants you to believe what he is saying. He wants you to trust that he is a man that won't lie. And that when you believe God, there's something that connects in your spirit. And he began to say that if God would open the windows of heaven, might this be? Behold, thou shalt see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat thereof. In the very next verse, and I gotta bring this in for a close, there were four leprous men who were at the entrance of the gate. They were sick. Sin had somehow riddled their life. And their leprosy, which was a type of sin, had, had taken their body. And there they were not allowed to go into the city. They were at the gate, and I just think they overheard what happened in the gate. That they overheard the prophet saying, Tomorrow about this time, there's going to be a breakthrough. Tomorrow about this time, 
that everything you need that has not been supplied that the enemy has cut off God is going to supply before I bring that into a conclusion do you know that it is the enemy's purpose to cut you off from the supply of God do you know that if he can cut you off from the things that God has for you that feeds you that nourish you if he can do that that ultimately you will die I began to ponder Amos the eighth chapter in which he said there's gonna be a famine coming in the land it's not gonna be a famine of bread but it's gonna be a famine for the hearing of the Word of God the New Testament talks about in the last days there's gonna be a lot of teachers because people are going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They're going to have conferences and speakers and more speakers and, and notes than they can really fit in all the shelves that they have. Not all of us should be teachers because with teaching is a greater judgment. But there is a famine in the land because though there be many teachers, not every teacher is from God. Not every prophet is a man or woman of God. And just because someone says they are one doesn't mean they is. If you would be, say that you're a teacher or you're a prophet, then your actions will confirm and be according to the word of God. And if it's contrary, let me just be so bold because I'm tired of playing with what the enemy would do to some minds. I'll be so bold as to say you're a false prophet and a false teacher and a false pastor that only those that follow the word of God are true let God be true and every man a liar for he is not a man that he would lie but I see at the gate of this city these four leprous men verse 4 says they have a committee meeting and they say well we got three options number one if we go in the city then we're gonna die in the city because they're starving us out so we're gonna die there if we stay here outside of the gate we don't have no food we're gonna die here he said if we go to our enemy and if we surrender to our enemy perchance they might keep us alive nothing else we might get prison food get a little something to eat what they didn't know was God was getting ready to use the most unlikely group of people. Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost. People that had been riddled by disease and sickness. People that society had shunned. People that were on the outside, not the inside. If you think you got to be on the inward track to be used of God, God's not looking for another superstar. He's not looking for a big I and a little you. He's just looking for someone who's willing to hear the word, be obedient, and do what God has said. If you want to be challenged, you need to mark Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. I don't have time to turn unless they can put it on the screen. But there's an interesting passage that says, If you be willing and obedient, you will eat of the good of the land. Not just, okay, I'm willing, I'll do it. Or not just, well, I'm obedient, but I'm just doing this under duress and under pressure. But when your spirit is to the point where you're so submitted to God, you say, I don't understand why and I don't know how. I don't know what's going to happen in all of this, but Lord, I'm willing to follow you. I'm willing to go all the way with you. I'm willing to obey you. He said, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat of the fruit of the land. And then he said, if you refuse and rebel, you'll be destroyed. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And as I bring this to a close, telling you that four unlikely men headed to what they thought could have been their demise. What they didn't know was God's amplification system. For God put his heavenly microphone under the feet of those four leprous men. Could I just have four young men come here? I'm not saying y'all are lepers. I just need to have four young men. Just come on. Just come stand up here. Now I want you to just kind of just walk. Just kind of stand shoulder to shoulder. I want you to just go ahead and stomp all the way across and then all the way back go ahead you're just walking but you don't have to walk real hard because they're hungry they're sick they don't have the weapons they can't fight nobody they're going to the syrian army the army has horses and chariots but while they're walking 
God's amplification system. God puts his heavenly microphone. And the Bible said that in the enemy's camp, what didn't seem likely in God's camp, in the enemy's camp, the enemy heard chariots and horses and they said well they have hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians and they're coming to destroy us by the time these four brothers get to the enemy camp they find that the camp is empty they left their horses they left their donkeys they left their tents they left their silver they left their gold they go into one tent they eat until they're full they hide the silver and gold they go into another tent they eat they hide the silver and gold and they say you know what we better tell somebody the enemy is gone those men had scattered i don't know what this means to someone here but I came with a prophetic word to tell you that it's time for you to move forward. You may feel like I'm undeserving. You might even feel like maybe this is my season to die. But the only thing you got to die out to right now is yourself and your own assignment and agenda. And if you will just say, I heard a word from God and I haven't seen it yet, but I just choose to believe it. If you'll get up and start moving, you'll begin to walk, God will walk with you. When you get to where you're going, God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. It's time to move forward. It's time for you to move forward. you got to step out of that depression. You've got to step out of that relationship that keeps leading you back to immorality. There's no one night stand that's worth you losing your soul over. You can't keep smoking and drinking and dipping and clubbing and think that you're just going to somehow slip in by the skin of your teeth. You know what separates us from God is sin. And it's not the fact that God doesn't love you. He loves you enough to correct you. And the correction of God should always lead you to repentance. And today I just come just as a preacher of the gospel. I'm nobody that God has saved. But it is my assignment to reach everybody in this city that I can. I'll love you. I'll preach with you. I'll pray with you. But there's one thing I can't do. I can't believe for you. you got to get up and move. you got to get out of the depression. you got to get out of the witchcraft. you got to get out of that alcoholism. you got to get out of that wrong thinking. There's only one way forward. And it is Jesus. For he said in the New Testament, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Every one of us today ought to stand and raise our hands today. And we just ought to confess with our mouth, Jesus, would you lead me out and bring me in? God wants to take you to a place where prosperity is real. You've been cut off the supply of God from his word and prayer and the house of God. All of those things have been cut off in your life because you've been distracted. Today I see a vision of someone in this congregation, they're filled with bitterness, but God loves them so deeply. And all it would take is for you to let go of that. Actually, I see two people. For you to let go of that and say, God, I just submit to you today. Let me tell you what's gonna happen. God will, he's gonna perfect you. He'll strengthen and establish you. And then first, Peter says, he'll settle you. That's why you've been so restless. But God wants to settle your spirit. And the same God that brought you out, he's gonna bring you out of captivity in a land of prosperity. But you gotta just believe him. Believe him, believe him for your healing. Believe him for your deliverance. Believe him. And today the call goes out. These young people bless me. It was an honor today to pray over my grandson. But I'm not the only one, there are many here that you're believing God generationally for your families. Young people, I want to just seal this North American Youth Congress. I want you to be the first in the altar to spread all the way across this altar. The Lord's calling you. He's calling you to be, as it were, a flame of fire to your generation. Youth leaders, I need you here today. Those of us which are older, is there anyone else that God's just calling? You just feel it. You're hungry. You're like those lepers. I'm hungry. If I don't get a word from God, I'm going to die. Here's the last verse. Blessed are they 
which hunger and thirst not after natural bread but after righteousness for they shall be filled come on I, I got I got a time to wait here today one of my prayers have been that God's gonna raise up preachers in this community if the Lord tarries there'll be those of you preaching the gospel some of you will be in other countries of the world you'll be feeding the hungry and ministering the gospel some of you are going to do it right here who is it who is it today someone else today you just need jesus you said i don't know if i'm called i don't know one thing i do know is i'm not called to stay at the city and die and you just get together and you start walking to what you think might be your end but I just came with a word from the Lord to tell you what you think is the end is actually the beginning. And you better remember this preacher today. It's time for you to move forward. Come on. Who else is it? I need a few, I need a few Holy Ghost filled men and women to just kind of stand. You don't have to even lay hands at this moment on anybody, but just come in and stand with your hands outstretched. And we're gonna start praying. If you need the Holy Ghost today. If you're believing the Lord today for anything, Jesus is the answer for the world today. He's my answer and yours. Who is it? Who is it? I see somebody on the back row in that back area. God's calling you. Don't be ashamed. Would you come? I want you to lift your hands. Lord Jesus, today we hear the word of the Lord. Today we repent of anything that separates us from you. And today we lift up our foot and we begin to move forward in the name of Jesus. We believe you today, God. We receive you today, God. We are not going to time. Now I want you to lift your voice up right now. I think some of you have been around a while. Help me pray. Lift your voice up, Lord Jesus. I speak faith right now to the people of God. I come against every adversary and I declare that what you have heard is not true. God is with you and they that are with you are more than be against you. I speak the word of faith to your life today. May sin be broken off. May the power of God be demonstrated. This is how In the name of God, Jesus, we pray. This is how I fight my battle. Now come on, I want you to fight. This is how I fight my battle. I want you to link up your force all over the building. And just begin to pray with me. is leading you to the prosperity of the Lord. 